Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Kurt Knowles, and I'm the director of the Mid-American Center for Contemporary Music at the College of Musical Arts of Bowling Green State University in Ohio. And this is the first event uh, of the 41st annual Bowling Green New Music Festival. Now, normally we'd be doing this in person in Bowling Green, uh, but circumstances as they are, we will be doing this uh, remote uh, and, uh, and, and recorded. Um, there will be uh, videos, uh, concert videos available on both the College of Musical Arts YouTube channel and the uh, Third Coast Percussion YouTube channel uh, starting on the 15th of October, which is today if you're, if you're watching this. Um, there will be links in the uh, description for this video. Um, now, I'm very, very pleased uh, to welcome our featured guest composer for this year, uh, Augusta Reed Thomas. Uh, we are with Gusty in her in her home studio, and we're just going to have a little uh, informal conversation about uh, about her music and music in general, and uh, and whatever else comes up. So, welcome, Gusty. Thanks, Kurt. I'm really honored to be here, and I'm I'm very humbled and thrilled to be your featured composer this year. I think that the festival you all run is exceptional and really important. I believe this is your 41st festival, and. Bravo to you for being the director at the moment and for your whole team and all the faculty colleagues and everyone who's playing. I would like to start by expressing my gratitude. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that we were able to continue doing it, uh, you know, even in, in a somewhat truncated form. Um, but uh, but I, I think what we have what we have going is still very, very strong. And, and the, the commitment to the music here is still such that we're able to, you know, power through uh, current events, and uh, and still put out a, a a positive experience for our faculty and students and for the world out there. So thank you very much for for agreeing to to stick with us through this. My pleasure. So um, let's start at the very beginning. Um, the question that I like to ask our our guest composers first every year. What what path brought you to here? To here? <laughs> what, uh, what, how did you become a composer? What was, what was your, the path in your life that led you to this moment? Oh, well, thank you. You know, when I was very little, I'm the 10th of 10 children. I was always into music. We had a little rickety old piano. My mom taught kindergarten for 30 some odd years. She supported the family, but she was also sort of an amateur pianist. So we had this piano in the house and starting at about age three and four, I used to constantly like play it, like plink, <laughs> you know, that would be it. Or like, Bloop. and I was constantly going to the piano or lying underneath it if someone was playing it. And then I started in, at about age four, you know, getting a little more touching on it. And then I was able to get piano lessons and played piano for many, many years. And then in third grade, I took up the trumpet, which is sort of a story. Uh, I was so into music and my name is Thomas and they lined us up alphabetically. So by the time <laughs> I got into the choosing room, they had euphonium trumpet or snare drum left. So I came home with a trumpet and my mother was like, what? I thought you wanted to play something else. But anyway, I ended up playing trumpet all the way through college. I was a trumpet performance major at Northwestern University, not a composition major. And of course I sang in choir and I played guitar and I just, it was music, 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 just all, all along. And then I was composing all through that, all through ninth grade, eighth grade, seventh grade, all through uh, high school and in, into college as well. So it was kind of a 20 year morph really from the little girl under the piano through all this performance and then you know, working over toward composing. And at the end of undergraduate, I was either going to, you know, like be a waitress or just do something to earn some money. Um, and my teacher said, just apply to one school. So I applied to Yale to work with Jacob Druckmann and I was lucky enough to get a full scholarship and I went to Yale as a master's degree student in composition. So that was my first sort of composition degree, but I had written an enormous amount of music through that whole process. And I think that going through that process is very important because I'm extremely empathetic to the player. 
I was on their side of the stage for most of my life. Like, what does the part look like? Where am I breathing? How does this feel to play? Is it fun? Do I know where I'm fitting in? You know, all this kind of thing that comes from being in all state band and all state orchestra and rehearsing and playing alone or solo and then playing in ensembles and then singing in choir. I feel like I bring all of that to my composition and I'm very glad that I had all those performance uh, skills and chops and opportunities for so many decades. And then fast forward from Yale onward, I've just been like, completely nonstop, relentless, all all in, guns blaring, composing every day. <laughs> so that's sort of the, the quick story. Mm -hmm. Was was there when you were very young, was there like was there like a piece? Did you did you did you have a moment where there was like the one piece where there was no going back after that? Well the composer? You know, we, we had what was, I think, called then a Victrola player. We had, like, records, and, and <laughs> you know, we didn't have that many. But my father, um, from whom my mother was separated, it was kind of sort of complicated. Anyway, he loved Bach, and he loved Mahler. And I remember we had Scriabin, we had the poem of ecstasy, and my dad used to not let us watch TV and make us listen to Bach every night. So I got... You know, at a while it was like, oh my gosh, now we have to sit and listen to you know, the well-tempered clavier. And then I remember when I was about seven or eight, I was like, wow, this is really good. I like this, you know. And so I, I actually have been obsessed with Bach literally my whole life. I listen to Bach every day and think about it every day. Bach is a great composition teacher. So in any case, I guess it would have to be Bach, but it wasn't, uh, it was really just a, a bunch of different things. So early on there in your academic composing career, you, you got to work with some I mean, really heavy hitting type people, J Jacob Druckmann and, uh, and Oliver Nussen at, 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 at Tanglewood and Bernstein. And uh, what, what was that like as a, as a very young composer? I mean, getting sort of thrown into, the, into that, that world, especially the sort of the Tanglewood Yale world. Yeah, I was really fortunate. When I was at Northwestern University, I had composed a lot of music. So I was, I'd probably, yeah, anyway. So um, Oliver Nussen reviewed my scores for Tanglewood and he uh, invited me. I think I was a sophomore at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. So young, maybe 22 or 21. I, I can't remember exactly, probably 22. And I went to Tanglewood to work with him and he was a fabulous teacher and a good friend. And then he had me back the following year. And then he had me back a third year. So I did uh, like uh, three years at Tanglewood with him. He was um, just terrific. I, I, I count him among my most valuable teachers and friends. And we stayed friends for a long time. He you know, brought my music to the Cleveland Orchestra and to the BBC proms and to the uh, South Bank Center and to the National Symphony. You know, he conducted it, he recorded it. So, you know, he was just um, wonderful. And I had the opportunity to commission pieces for him from him when I was composer in residence with the Chicago Symphony and program a lot of his work. And so it was a, it was a longstanding friendship and I feel very grateful. And then after those three Tanglewood summers is when Jacob accepted me at Yale. And that was wonderful. Um, terrific composer and teacher and you know the whole Yale team was fabulous Marty Bresnik and the, the whole the whole the whole scene there and I ended up doing only one year at Yale I never got a master's degree but don't tell anyone <laughs> you know I don't have a degree I just did the one year uh, and then I went to the Royal Academy of Music on a fellowship and then I won a Guggenheim and then I just never went back to school. I just sort of kept going as a, as a young composer. And I loved Yale. It was always the intention to go back, but um, it just it just the way it went. And then I you know, just joined the profession quite young, actually. Mm -hmm. And I started teaching at Eastman. Uh, I think I'm on my 27th year of teaching. Hard to believe, because I, I started there in 93. So I was 29 years old, 28 when I got the Eastman job and have been teaching ever since. So 
it's it's just been sort of nonstop since really since Ollie invited me to Tanglewood. Oh, so let, let's talk about about how you work uh, as a composer. You know, what what what? How do you begin? What what is your what is your process like now nowadays? And how and how might that have changed from being a young student composer to being more project oriented? Maybe is is the way to put it, or you know, commission oriented, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, for me to to create music, it has to come from a deep necessity to make it. It has to come from deep inside. And then you need to have good health and energy. To write these huge pieces is so much work. Even to write a solo piece is so much work. And to put your own soul into it, and your own character, your own voice, your own nuance, and to uh, follow your own star and to have your own opinion and so on and so forth. So I usually start with that deep desire to make something. And after that, I often, uh, well, I always improvise. I, I think of a sound uh, or any kind of sound, and then I improvise and I scat and I sing and I dance and I play the piano and I um, start to feel what, what the piece can be. And I try to find things, the unexpected things, throwing lots of things out along the way until I start to get you know, some material and then I kind of dream about that material and experiment with it and see where it could go or what its potential is or uh, how it might unfold. What, is, it, is, it, is it worthy? Is it personal? Is it special? Is, is it, should it be developed? And then from there, I try to build materials from it and sort of pull things out of it. And it starts to get very, very intentional and very, very precise. And then from there, I, I build the whole piece out. And I, I tend to think of my music as very or, or very organic. Everything is coming from something which came from something which came from my own body, from my own ears, from my own improv, from my own singing, from my very embodied sound and very heard. People may like my music or they may not like my music, but you can tell that I heard it. Like it's, you know, the notes are clean, even when it gets complex and you can, you can feel that, um, it's not being randomly generated or from some external system. And then my scores are, here's my email popping up. I don't know why, there we go. Um, my scores are very nuanced in terms of uh, articulations, dynamics, adjectives, tempos, front matter. I mean, it's very um, intricate notation. And mostly out of respect for the player. You're like, here's what I intend and giving them a very clean score so that they can take all of their years of expertise or decades of expertise and make magic. You know, really not have to call me up and say, well, what's the dynamic here or what's the tempo there? You know, it's just boom, it's right there. And so I spent a lot of time sculpting and polishing and proofreading and all, and all of that. And you know, it's, it's, it's super fun. I love, I love it. Love to write music and I do it every day. And then of course I do lots of other things as, as do you and as does many others, but I feel most healthy when I'm creating things. Is, is there a particular time of day you have carved out where it's like, I'm writing from here to here and don't call me, don't look at me, don't, <laughs> don't bug me. You know, I have terrible insomnia, so I, um, so anyway, I, I'm usually working by 4 a.m., but it's not a chore or like, oh my gosh, how can she work at 4 a.m.? It's just that I'm up and my mind is racing and I'm thinking and I like it. I, I'm up before the sun and I have my nice big huge cup of coffee and I go into my zone and I I love it. it. It's just, I get upset if I sleep till five o'clock and, <laughs> but I don't wake myself up. If I do sleep, that's fine or something. But, but essentially I do these very early morning things and I try to not teach at the university until like 12 o'clock so that I can really work from four till 10 and then have time to shower and maybe eat something and get down to the university and park and teach or even starting at 1230 or something like that. I really value getting my whole creative day done early. 
But on the other hand, if I have a full day, I'll just keep working till 11 at night. I'll just plow, just go through and not nonstop. I like these long days. But very often, you know, without COVID, I'm traveling every week and I serve on lots of boards and I run a center and I'm running an ensemble. And, you know, it's very, very, very busy. So it's not like I'm, I can always just sit here and compose all day, but I try to get six hours done every, every morning. Wow. Um, another part of, of uh, your process that I'd like to touch on, and, and I've, I've, this is another question I've asked to a lot of, of composers, is about titles. You have very, very evocative titles, but they're never like very long titles in a lot of ways. They're short and sweet, and, and they get the mind going. I just wondered, I was wondering if you'd be willing to address some of that and say maybe where some of that comes from, or if, is it poetic? You know, is it literary things? Is it, is that just from this wellspring within you? Is it, uh, uh, is that something you've been, you think very, very hard on? Oh, well, thanks for asking. That's really thoughtful of you. I, uh, most of my titles, if you just go to my website or something, you go to alphabetical list and just read the titles. Most of them are pointing to things that are spiritual or things that have to do with the natural world, the sun, the moon, the stars, um, spirit, um, prayers, uh, you know, th these kinds of image images. But none of my titles tell you what are they. Like, so mm -hmm. ritual incantations, what is that? It's some kind of ritual, some kind of spiritual ritual maybe, and it's a big sort of long song. But so it, it's not saying, you know, it's for the victims of this, or it's about that, or it, it's not or you just open a space or spirit musings. Okay, it's some spirit musing. Or, um, you know, I, that, I, I like titles that sort of point in a direction of, of these cosmic and, and spiritual places, but that don't over speak what they are. Yeah, that you're not, you're not showing your cards too early in the game, so to speak. Yeah, and also I don't, I don't want to, I mean, I'm people, lots of people have different ways of doing this. Some people, like every piece is dedicated to like some specific, very, very specific thing. And it's about that. And the second movement is like when this happened and, and that's fine. I'm much more writing this organic music that's bubbling up and the pieces are uh, really about music. They're about harmony and counterpoint and pockets and color and balance and flow and flux and form and density and empathy with the musicians and all of the thousands of other parameters of music. That's really where I, I live. I, I live right there at as close to the music as possible. And my titles are just spaces to enter if you'd like to come hear a piece. And I think it's also, you know, I don't have any categories. Like I've never been a, like now I'm a spectralist or now I'm a minimalist or now I'm a, a drone composer or now I'm, I've never done any of that. Like I just, all of my music is just the piece itself. So I think when people want to know something about my music, they have to just listen to a piece um, because it, it isn't a category. It, it's, it's just the work of what, of where, where my, my ears are really, where my ear and my heart is. And I think that, uh, you know, it's a sort of, everything's just very organic at every level. Yes, that's, that's, that's great. Um, so changing gears a little bit, as I look at my notes here, I almost lost for a second. Um, you have an awful lot of orchestral music. You have, you have a, you've written a lot of orchestral music and you've had it performed by professional orchestras all over the world, you know, every, really just about everybody. Um, and I was wondering if you could discuss how your experiences with American orchestras and European orchestras might be, might how those experiences might have been a little different from one another. And, uh, you know, how, how, has, has to have those differences, boy, I'm stepping on my, stepping on my tongue here. Um, do, what, what, what have you learned from those differences in terms of, uh, of how, how orchestras, you know, function and prepare music? Yeah, I mean, 
I love the orchestra. I think it's one of the greatest constructs of Western civilization. Strong words, I realize. But when you think of what developed over several hundred years, uh, debate you, where, where do you want to start this at Monteverdi <laughs> or before, or, you know, place it wherever you want to start. But then you, you move forward and you get to, let's say, the Strauss Orchestra or the Mahler Orchestra, these huge orchestras. Um, and Debussy and Ravel and so on and so forth. Uh, it's really an incredible instrument that has developed over time. And I, I grew up living in it. So I was sitting there in the trumpet row, listening and imagining, oh, what sounds could I make? And that kind of thing. It was good I was a trumpet player, maybe then a string player, because I had time in the, with all my bars of rest you know, to start imagining as a composer. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that there are many great orchestras in this world. Many of them are in Europe and many in the United States. I feel blessed for working with lots of them. I, I find it very interesting in, in my own work as to which conductor is conducting and how much rehearsal time is allotted by that conductor and what else is on the program. And one of the things I care quite a lot, well, I care very much about is tempos. So for instance, if I set a tempo that's like, uh, you know, something like, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And it's played like, you know, I hate it. It's just like not what I wrote, but it's much easier to play. And it's much easier to rehearse if you slow it down, but it's not what I wrote. And it makes all the proportions that I worked out. I, I, I work very hard on my, my forms as some of you may have seen some of my maps of form and things of this kind of thing on my website, uh, it messes up all the proportions because all of a sudden the fast music section is you know two minutes longer than it was supposed to be and so on. So for instance, I loved working with Mr. Boulez. He commissioned, I think three works for me. He toured works, he recorded works. Um, uh, and it was incredible because he's just very, he starts the first rehearsal right at tempo. Just like, okay, here, this is it. We got to play it at this tempo. He may then rehearse a little slower, but he, he gets everyone realizing like, this is what we're building here. And I loved that very much. And I loved working with Oliver Nussen also because he was very terrific composer, a world-class composer, but likewise a world-class conductor. And that's rare. He had both skills uh, in the extreme. And he was also very good with tempo and form and pacing and, um, describing things. And I super appreciated that. And, and others, right now, Ken David Mazur, who has Milwaukee Symphony and others, uh, is a terrific conductor. And I love how he conducts my music and the tempos he plays. So that's just one thing I, I'm for sort of particularly sensitive about. And then I wouldn't really want to compare sort of to your question, if, if that was part of it, like the European orchestras to the America, because it really depends on the context of the concert. If it's a summer festival at Lucerne and they're trying to put on four concerts in a day and you have a limited rehearsal, or maybe it's the big featured concert at Lucerne and it's the one that gets four days of rehearsal and it's the main concert, it, it, it could be the same festival with a different kind of purview over a particular concert. Um, so I just feel really blessed to write for orchestra and want to keep doing it until the day I die. I know that you had scheduled some of my orchestral work, which was so lovely of you. And of course it's not being able to be performed, but um, I, I appreciate that. And, you know, I also loved being with you all when you had the Toledo Symphony there. And I think, I can't remember if I was your mentor teacher or whatever my title was, but I was coaching younger composers on their orchestral works. And I thought you guys did a wonderful job of that program. And I appreciated being part of that. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, we, we do, uh, for those at home, we do uh, um, every year, except for this year, uh, we do a program with the Toledo Symphony Orchestra. Toledo's just, just a couple of miles away um, where they come down and, uh, and do uh, readings and recordings of select student compositions. And then we bring in a composer, uh, Gusty, a couple of years back. Um, 
and uh, they sort of serve as a composition mentor, and we they go over recordings and talk about things, and and it's it's a very rewarding experience for uh, for all those involved. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a, I'm I'm so glad that we that we have that program, and it's going to continue. It's just not going to continue this year, unfortunately. It's a wonderful um, program. So I, I would be remiss if I did not uh, talk about all of the really great things you're doing in Chicago right now um, with the, uh, uh, the Center for Contemporary Composition, uh, uh, the Ear Taxi Festival, Grossman Ensemble. There's a, there's a list as long as my arm of, of these wonderful programs that you're, that you're running there. Could, could we talk about how, how the, especially well, the, the Center for Contemporary Composition and, and Ear Taxi sort of came about? Sure. I mean, big picture, I would say that uh, my my main thing in life is as a composer, but I also teach, and I see those as two circles that connect. You know, if I'm writing every day, I'm making sound every day. I'm touring, I'm recording, and so on. And then I'm I'm speaking to to my graduate students who are doing the same. It's very organic. It's a lovely thing to do. And for about 30 years, I, I feel like I've had a third circle, which I can't do with my hands here, that overlaps, which I would call just generally something like citizenship. So for instance, it was 25 years ago or a long time ago, I was the chairman of the board of the American Music Center. I was on that board for 10 years. And these are volunteer positions that require an enormous amount of time. And I serve on the Copeland board, the Kusevitsky board, the Ditson board, the Monaco board, tons of advisory boards. So, you know, there's just this, this huge amount of sort of citizenship where it's it's just trying to help the profession at large because if I'm composing and trying to help my students and I want to help the profession. And so one of the things I put together was the Music Now series at the Chicago Symphony, which is still thriving. And that was my brainchild. I wrote the proposal and I spoke to the initial donors and put it together. I emceed the festival for 10 years from the stage. I programmed it. I did all the commissions and so on. It was a huge, huge project. And then uh, in 2016, I did the Ear Taxi Festival, which was a massive oh, entire citywide festival that this close came to killing me. I was so <laughs> exhausted from three years of it. Massive job, but we did something I can't remember, honestly. I, I just can't remember. Was it like 88 world premieres or so, something like this? And then a ton of other pieces. And we had the whole city involved, all the universities, both radio stations, the running marathon, the, you know, the Harris Theater, the Cultural Center, all the, you know, it was just like the whole city was involved. And it was a, a, an amazing thing. But we also run a postdoc in contemporary classical art music. And every year we get like 120 applicants from all over the world and they can come and have a full year at an excellent salary to just write their music here at the University of Chicago and write for the Grossman Ensemble and our other ensembles and be part of our community. Um, distinguished guest composers. This year, my distinguished guest composer was my good friend, Tanya Leon. She was fabulous. She wrote a great piece for Grossman. She was typically her usual uh, amazing self in every way. And then we have uh, very research projects and I bring in special guest artists and uh, visiting ensembles. So it's like this huge center with all kinds of different things going on. The center of which is the Grossman Ensemble, which is a 13 player ensemble, a fixed ensemble. And we do 12 commissions a year of composers who are established and we just put out our first disc actually. And the way we do this is that the composers ha have the chance to write a piece over three months. So they can write their piece or a sketch and work it out with the ensemble and then throw it all out or start over or keep some of it or change it or move it up the, do it everything they want and then come back three weeks later and work with the ensemble again. And then do it the same kind of thing, workshop it and come back three weeks later and do it again. And then come back three weeks later and do it again. So it's, it's really about the process as much as the product. And I wanted to build it that way because mostly composers are like, here's your commission, first rehearsal Wednesday, counter Thursday. <laughs> you know? And to be able to write a piece over three months with all the musicians in the room at every single rehearsal, we record all these rehearsals so the composers can refer back to it. It's a very expensive project, uh, to be honest, to have all those engineers, 
recording and the hall and the piano tuner and all the players for the whole day and flying the composers in so many times. But everybody's piece gets so much better over the three months. So it's as much about process as it is about the product. The, the product is the final concert, but it's really, really a wonderful opportunity. And every composer we've offered it to is like, yes, <laughs> please, because we, we just don't get that opportunity. So that's very time consuming, just that one project of the center alone, not to mention the other ones. So anyway, this is all in this category of citizenship and trying to make things better for other composers and get them commissions and get them funded and get them performances and recordings. And so I've done an enormous amount of that. That was a very long answer, but um, <laughs> it's, it's a huge part of my day every day for decades. And I feel that it's important for composers to give back. And I've, I can honestly say with my bone marrow, <laughs> you know, I've really tried really hard to give back to everybody. I, I think that that's something that maybe isn't stressed enough when when composers are are in school is that that idea of that you don't just have your blinders you're you're not alone in this you are not you are part of a huge community and it's not crabs in a barrel it's not you know it, 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 if if we all help help each other we can all succeed and and you know giving back is you know, just and doing what you can when you can for whom you can, is just such a very important part of, of being a composer and a steward of new music, I think, in this day and age. Absolutely. And I, I have to say, as, as a, a kid who grew up in the Chicago suburbs and, you know, began doing new music stuff, you know, back in the, you know, the early, early 90s, um, Back then, if you wanted to go see new music stuff in like 1989, 1990, it was sort of Cube or whatever Ralph Shapey was doing in a lot of ways. <laughs> and I do just I mean, what you have done, you know, to, to, to help further, you know, the new music world of Chicago is just mind boggling to me. And it's, and it's, I think it's, the city is so much richer for it. And it, you know, just the scene there is so, vibrant and complex and alive now. And that's, I, I think it's a lot of has to do with, with the work that you've done. So as a, as a you know, inveterate Homer for Chicago, <laughs> thank you, so. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, um, I, it's a great city and great people. And, you know, there's a lot of young people that are moving to Chicago now, young composers, like mm -hmm. the scene is out there, let's go, you know. and. You can come, there's so many new music groups and so much going on and it's a very positive environment. And so it's it's something for younger composers to really consider, like coming into this kind of vibe. Yeah, certainly a lot of our students have, you know, when back in the old days, it was, you know, New York or bust. Now it's kind of, Chicago is almost the default now in a lot of ways. It's, it's a great mm -hmm. new music city. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, talking about ensembles from the city, I mean, you have a very long standing relationship now with Third Coast Percussion. Um, and of course, they are there are our ensemble for the festival. They will be performing the world premiere of Conmodo on their their concert on, on a Friday, uh, the 16th, on that uh, New Music Festival concert. Could you talk, talk just a, briefly about, about how you came to? you know, become so closely intertwined with them? Sure. Well, first of all, they're wonderful people and citizens and players and artists. They're good friends of mine. Actually, they reached out to me. I can't, I honestly can't remember. 2008, 2008 or 2009, I mean, way back, sort of asking for advice about starting a new music group and getting a 501c3 and how do you do that? And I was just sort of, I don't know what, like a, a friend advisor type, you know, kind of with them. And um, the first piece I did for them was I believe in 2011, which is a piece called Resounding Earth, which is for bells from all over the world. And we had a wonderful collaboration on that. And then since then we've made many pieces together. They're, you know, just uh, 
wonderful. That's, that's, that's all I can say. And I like to write rhythmic music and I like to write colorful music and I always have. My music has lots of different rhythmic syntaxes. Like any piece of mine you pick, there's going to be, you know, it's not all just one rhythmic syntax. I vary that as part of the fabric of the piece. And so they're obviously extremely good at rhythm. <laughs> so it's just super fun to, to write for them. And the, the new piece is called Con Moto. As you said, it is the world premiere. And in this piece, it's a percussion quartet. But inside this quartet, they each have a mallet instrument, like a vibraphone or a marimba. Like, so there's a quartet of those. And then they each have um, drums of different styles, pitches, uh, colors, and so forth. And then they each have bells, crotals or a bell or chimes or something. So there's a quartet of drums and then there's a quartet of bells. And then they each have shakers. So a ratchet, an egg shaker, uh, a guiro, a scraper. They, they each have a couple of those, a quartet of those. And then there's, they all have triangles. So there's sort of five quartets of those colors inside this little quartet called Conmoto. And these colors flicker very, very fast with lots of little hockets going between them. So you have a triangle here and a triangle and a ratchet, you know, it's moving like that. And this requires enormously quick mallet changes and multiple mallets in each hand and an agility to be able to, you know, get to the mallet instrument and then move over to the scraper and then get to your triangle and so on. And they're great at that. So this piece is a little bit about that. Much of the piece is very jazzy and kind of whimsical and light and dance-like and, uh, very kind of fast moving, but the times it opens up into sort of a very more reverberant space. And it's highly nuanced, very carefully notated, fully composed. And it's kind of in, in episodes that one leads to the next, which leads to like organically unfolding the piece as it were. Piece lasts about seven minutes. So I'm really excited for people to hear them play it and to share this world premiere. And I should say, it's kind of fun. It was commissioned by the children of my friend, Cynthia Sargent, who was having her 80th birthday. And their children decided instead of getting her a silver bowl or a dinner out or something, <laughs> they would commission a brand new piece, which I think is a super cool present. And Cindy Sargent was one of the donors who supported the Music Now series significantly. And she also endowed the composer in residence chair at the Chicago Symphony, which I held the meet. So we have this very, very long relationship. She's absolutely beautiful and radiant and the piece is for her. So it's just like, it's just a whole nice thing. She's such a great philanthropist in person. And then third coast is right here. And then I'm right here. And then we've all like, it's sort of like in the family. Mm. And, um, I like that that spirit about it. And then her children commissioning it, and I'm sure they'll be watching the world premiere. Well, so, you know, it's, it's a nice thing, so. So again, the world will be watching a premiere and not attending a premiere, unfortunately. Uh, so the world, the world has changed quickly and, and uh, not necessarily for the better uh, over the last six months. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. Uh, but what advice would you have for young composers as we, as we move forward in a, just a, a different sort of physical space, head space, um, that may never go 100% back to what, what we thought of as normal? Well, I think the most important thing is to be honest and integral and to have empathy for others and to try to help the profession at large and to be yourself and to follow your own star and to work really hard. I mean, I've been working like 16 hours a day since I was 15. I mean, like literally. 365 days a year. I know it sounds like hyperbole, like it can't be true or something like that, but it's actually what I do. I just work 
all day long, every day, all day Christmas, all day Thanksgiving. You just got to work really hard, or at least I have to. Maybe others can do it with less time, but I, I think you, you know, you have to be willing to really work for this also. But you have to keep all those things I just said first, and you know, you have to have a very good toolkit in terms of good ears, good understanding of harmony, good understanding of repertoire, an excellent sense of you know, counterpoint and rhythmic. And uh, you know, it's just like you have to have a craft, really. But you also have to have an incredible imagination. Like, wh what do you want to say, and how do you want to say it? And then you have to have this work ethic. So I think it's very hard to be a great composer. <laughs> you know, we all know that. That's why we're all trying to, you know, compose. It's very humbling. But I think it, it's something that I would advise that you really do with your whole heart if you want to do it, because it's at least for me, I couldn't do it halfway. It, it's it's an all or nothing kind of thing for me. And I think it's a beautiful thing to try to be writing music. And there's nothing more beautiful than working with live players on a piece and bringing forth a new piece or hearing someone else's new piece that was beautifully rendered and made. It's very important for our culture and the arts really, really matter. And artists have, you know, really been saying things forever. And when we look back at civilization, we look at what the artists made. We look at the cathedrals and we look at the monuments and we look at the sculptures and we look at the frescoes and we look at the cave paintings. And these are the things that we look back on and trying to understand former civilizations and humanity. And um, it's important that the artists are supported and able to do their work. Well, excellent. I, I, I could not agree more with you. I, I think we're needed more than ever right now in a lot of ways. And, and institutions that support artists are needed more than ever. And I, I'm glad that, that you and I can still do that, that we're, our institutions allow us to do that. Um, so that's, I think that's about all we have time for. I wanted to thank Augusta Reed Thomas for inviting us into her studio uh, to have this little talk today. Um, again, concerts uh, uh, begin, well, if you're watching this video on the day it's released tonight on the, the 15th of October, Third Coast is on the 16th. Uh, and then we have chamber music concerts on the 17th and 18th as well. Um, there is a music of uh, Gustry Thomas on all on every single one of these concerts, so you can't go wrong with any of them. Plus, a lot of other really great composers uh, performed by our faculty and students, as well as uh, as Third Coast. So, thank you again, Gusty. Um, so, again, I'm Kurt Doles from uh, College of Musical Arts, Bowling Green State University. Uh, thank you for taking some time to come and see us, and I hope you enjoy our 41st annual New Music Festival presentations.